what infrastructure needs and challenges uh, for Long Island and clothing. That's the very good. Um, unfortunately for us, we have critical water challenges here on Long Island. You all know that 100% of our drinking water comes from aquifers. Excellent, we're getting an A so far. Um, and that means that we have 3 million people living on top of our sole source of drinking water. What could possibly go wrong? Well, the answer is a great deal of things. And they are. So from toxic chemicals in our drinking water, from inadequately treated sewage, what would a holiday meeting be without a good discussion of sewage, um, to upgrading our technology and our infrastructure, all of those are challenges we face as an island. Because we are an island. I've heard talk and gotten calls about what if we do desalinization plants? What if we do this? You know, Israel does it. And yes, I know that, but they don't have rain there. And, um, and they haven't, and they need to do it. But those kind of fixes are very, very costly, very energy intensive, and um, very hard to site locate. So our plan is let's take care of what we have now before we look for the quick fix and the hour. Because what we have now is very special and it's also very needed. And that is we need clean, safe drinking water. So the four people behind me are going to talk about the various um, uh, projects going on across Long Island to attain the goal of clean water, whether it's in the infrastructure or whether it's in planning, uh, all of that is needed. So our first speaker is Alan Raymond. Okay, I've only known her for like 15 years. <laughs> I'm going to call this the way. Um, Alan is from Suez. Suez is a globally unknown company that deals with water issues, wastewater issues, drinking water issues, and this is their, um, their project on Long Island is managing the Nassau County sewage treatment plants, which are very large, if some of you don't know that. Nassau County, about 70 to 80 percent of Nassau County is sewer, and that is basically two plants. There's more than that, but the two large plants are the Bay Park plant, which is about 50 million gallons per day, and the Cedar Creek plant, which is about 50 million to 55 million gallons per day. So those two plants actually take care of um, 80 percent of Nassau County's sewage. And um, Alan and his very competent team are in charge of managing that, improving those wastewater plants, which when they got there, they definitely needed improvements. And also now on their own, which I'm going to talk about, they talk, they're doing and implementing such important things as water reuse and water conservation. So Alan? Thanks, Adrian. Should I use the microphone or is it okay if I just talk? Can you It's okay? All right. You can see I didn't even ask that. Yeah. <laughs> I knew you didn't. <laughs> um, okay, so last year I was on this panel. Uh, we had a nice projector over here that was facing kind of that direction, so it wasn't very useful. I didn't have a PowerPoint, I just had a chat. So this year I said, well, I'm going to have a PowerPoint, so naturally there is no <laughs> but, but I'll, uh, which is a shame because that's important. Uh, so I'm going to talk. You can pull it off. I can. So I'm going to talk about uh, resiliency. So the improvements that the, the county has made uh, towards resiliency of the, of the facilities, and the investments that are have been made and are ongoing, um, and then also what has been done and what we're looking forward to in terms of using the inherent value in the wastewater system. Because while you know the sewer systems were, were collecting and treating sewage right to protect the environment. The facilities have a lot of value that's useful for the community. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the efforts that we made there. So, so resiliency, the biggest example of that is the Sandy Recovery effort that was focused mainly on the Bay Park Street facility, but also um, on, on sort of the distribution facilities, the drop and collection systems, the pump station. Uh, Sandy, uh, part of the lead of that survey, seven and a half uh, but the effects are still being felt and uh, still recovering from that and that's uh, throughout the community but there's no different than the county facilities. At the Bay Park Treatment Plant, the facility, I, I'm happy to report that the construction work for resiliency, which is basically storm hardening and, and recovery repair from the damage, it's about 70% complete, maybe a little bit more. So, yeah. And the 
facility, it's the, the Bay Park facility and the pump stations are in a much better position than they were before the storm. So uh, they're actually, there are facilities in place to protect them against the Sandy Lake storm and even much larger. So um, the Bay Park plant itself was uh, mostly flooded, but even the high elevation areas on the plant site that weren't flooded above ground, everything beneath the ground was completely flooded because there's a ton of, a ton of so when the water came on site, it got down into the tunnels and flooded everything out. Not to play off lines for four days, it was just brought down partially. So today, um, or what the plan was to okay, not only repair the damage there, but also flooded, but then also right, protect it. In other words, protect it from the storm. And the biggest example of that is a storm uh, wall, wall that was constructed berm that was constructed around the entire perimeter of the site. It's actually been completed for a couple of years. But uh, some of the elements that are part of that, like stormwater pump stations that are built inside the berm to uh, pump stormwater out when a, when a rain event happens, they're still being completed today. So most of that is completed. Um, all the pumps that were flooded out uh, beneath the, that were underground or below surface, they're being replaced or have been replaced with submersible type pumps or submersible motors, so the electrical equipment. If if the berm, which is built for a 500 foot flood, not a not the standy, but a much larger storm, even if it breached or was overtopped, uh, the equipment that's below the grain now is, is designed to run underwater. So even if the flood plant site got flooded, it would it would continue to run. And all the electrical, basically the entire electrical distribution system had to be replaced and all the electrical equipment has been raised above the level of the berm. So again, uh, if the storm overtopped and filled in uh, the, the wall, it actually breached the wall, the electrical equipment is still protected so that the facility will still run. So, so it's really been built to withstand the next storm, really resilient. Um, and then in addition, the equipment that's been replaced with air really was focused towards just protecting the environment as well. So the facility itself, the equipment process is much more resilient, much more reliable. And you can actually see that in the plant performance. The plant performance is uh, our, our, our permit standards for uh, the facility that we remove just basic parameters are 85% renewables. Of solids and fibers uh, and blocks that that way, and just keep on going. <laughs> We're supposed to remove 85%. The Bay Park plant today removes 96, 97, 98% of solids and fields. So it runs really, really well. And credit to the improvements that are The work that's been done has been done all over the entire site. Right? The site is completely flooded and put across the site is destroyed. So there's work all over, and I have a really nice map that we graphically present that to you. Um, but you know, again, it's about 70 percent complete. There are some really important projects that have not started yet that are coming. One is uh, side stream biological nutrient removal, so to help remove more nutrients that are currently being discharged into the western base, so an environmental improvement project. And then also um, a, a project to bring utility power in to supply the needs of the facility. Uh, Today, uh, the plant generates its own power on site, which is good. We have control over the desk. And we have large energy generators that try to use natural gas, diesel, use biogas, and produce on site. But the plan is uh, to bring in utility power, do a dual feed line through the uh, to make the plant more resilient and actually increase the electrical feed capacity to the plant because there are some upcoming projects that will require more energy than what we use today. The DNR process, for one, needs a lot more energy to remove the nutrients. But then more importantly, and it's part of an overall Western Bay's resilience initiative, there's a project that we may or may or may not know about, which is to uh, remove the discharge of the Bay Park plant from the Western Bay's. Right? So apparently, again, it's a intercoastal waterway where this effluent gets discharged to, and nutrient loads impacts the wildlife and the, and the saltwater marshes. So we're going to remove that from the western bays and divert that flow, the treated effluent, over to go out through the Cedar Creek plant effluent pipe, which goes out two and a half, three miles off the coast of, of Long Island, of the south shore of Long Island. So we'll take it out of the intercoastal waterways and put it into the ocean. And that project, again, is part of an overall initiative, which includes uh, 
commission of the city of Long Beach is raised for the plan. Um, that, that plan will be decommissioned and that flow will be diverted to Bay Park for treatment. So better treatment, centralized treatment, again, removing that nutrient load from the western base, as well as a, a longer term project uh, of potentially sewering uh, Park Hill County. To the system. So, so that that's future, and that's what's coming, and that's where I talk about you know the future resilience. So, so it's a really exciting uh, investment that's going on in NASA. Now, finally, the last thing I'd like to talk about is uh, talk about the value of the facilities and how we're we're looking at the facilities critically and using the value that's in turn for the benefit. Uh, and, and there's one thing that Suez has, has helped kind of kickstart that in, uh, for the county. Um, we, we recently uh, commissioned this past summer a, uh, a water reuse facility at the Cedar Creek. So the Cedar Creek facility is very similar in the size and, uh, and complexity to the Big Park plant. It has power generation on site. It uses a lot of water for the process to cool the generator for flushing. Uh, cleaning equipment on the site for seal water for various pieces of equipment. So it's a lot of water, up to a million gallons of water a day. That water, up until the last few months, was groundwater that was purchased from the local water plant and that was used throughout the facility. Now, these plant uses do not need drinking water quality. And our groundwater re resource is very precious to us. It's under tremendous pressure from the population. Legacy pollution, pollution issues, saltwater intrusion, things like this. So um, we looked at it and we said, well, we can take, rather than use this drinking water, we can take a side stream from the plant point, put it to a little higher standard, and use that in place of drinking water. Um, and the, the use for plant purposes is about 80% of our total water uses throughout the facility. So um, we built a uh, Suez fund, it was about a little over a million dollars to, to build a water reuse facility, small one on site for the plant purposes. Uh, it's not rocket science, it's very simple. It's strainers, big strainers, and uh, ultraviolet light, the ultraviolet unit, which is used to disinfect the water and make it safe for distribution around the land. And then a little post chlorination to maintain the residual in the pipe and network, just like you would in the But um, very simple. And now we have, in fact, based on the recent data, again, I had it on the slide, so sorry, I can't show you the actual data, but we, we're actually saving more, we're doing a little better than we thought. We're saving yeah, a little bit more than 80%, 81%, 82% for our plant usage. I think we still have a little bit of work more to go. We might have that a bit more. And we're certainly saving, it's helping us conserve, you know, we're, we've been using the uh, amount of up to 300 million gallons a year. Right now, most certainly, it's about 220 million gallons a year. It's not being pumped out of the atmosphere. So, so it's a really, really exciting, successful project. And something that going forward, we want to replicate at Bay Park. At another smaller facility on the North Shore, we have the Glen Cove wastewater treatment facility, part of the county system. We'd like to do some water reuse there. And we want to be a bit more ambitious. It's very nice that we're using it inside the plant site. It's a lot of water. But if we treat it maybe at a little higher level, we can use it off, off site, out in Suffolk County, um, in uh, Riverhead. Yes. In Riverhead. They use a, there's a, a, a wastewater reuse plant they, they use to irrigate a uh, local golf course. We can do the same thing at Bay Park. There's a county golf course just in the south of the facility. We can take some of the plant effluent and irrigate that golf course. And really, when you think about it, other parts of the country do a lot more why couldn't we look into putting a gray water distribution network out into the community that can be used for lawn irrigation, landscape irrigation in the community? Why couldn't we car washes? Certainly there are even industrial use. There's some industrial properties that are nearby. Why couldn't we pipe some water over there that they can use for their process needs rather than using drinking water? So we can be a bit more ambitious. I think people it's not it's not intuitive in this part of the country with all the rain that we get that uh, you know we necessarily need use our water, but certainly with the specific needs of Nassau County, Suffolk County, Long Island, pressures on our groundwork, I think we need to think about this. We can use as much of this resource as we possibly can to, to offset the pressures on our groundwork. And that's not the only thing that's available in the plants. Our water, the water use is one value that's in there. There's also uh, biogas, I mentioned that before, that's a 
byproduct of the process. We can do some process enhancements, generate more biogas. We can clean that gas, and we can use the gas for further plant purposes to run the generators currently on site. Boilers to heat the buildings, need it for the process. But if we clean it up well enough, we can actually distribute it into the, the, uh, the community gas network, right? It's the same, it's like natural gas. So we can use it for the community, and, and I know recently the moratorium on connections was raised, but this could help offset that, that deficit that we have in the gas supply on the island. Uh, and then finally, uh, the biosolids, which is the, the, the byproduct of the, another byproduct of the process, the solids that are removed from the sewage before we discharge to the ocean. If we currently do stabilize it with a process called digestion, right? And some of that, a good, actually a good size portion of that, is taken to Lindenhurst and put a dryer to create a product that is beneficial to use for the user. It can be used as fertilizer, right? So you can use it for agricultural use. We can make process modifications right at the plant sites themselves to create what's called a plastic biosolid that we can use to uh, for beneficial uses uh, on the island or the plants and other places. So a lot of value in these uh, in these um, facilities. We're headed in the direction of, of, of kind of identifying it, educating everybody, and developing these projects. Great. So that's it. Good questions. But I feel compelled to say, as a moderator and as an independent voice, that you know when Suez first came uh, to Long Island, we found the community was a little skeptical. Who is this multinational, you know, corporation going to come and manage the wastewater treatment plants? But I have to say, they have done a stupendous job. And you know, some of you, most of you know me. I don't lavish praise easily. Um, but they really have done not only what they committed to do, but they also went far above that. They said yes, because we had met with them prior to them getting the contract at Nassau County. We had group of environmentalists, the Nature Conservancy, CCE, Operation Splash. And we said, we want you to not just manage the sewage treatment plant. We want you to treat this as a resource, an important resource for the county and for the environment. And they said, we get it. That's what we do in other areas. We asked them to reduce the nitrogen out of the um, bay walk to a treatment plant. They said we'll do it, and they are doing it by 50%. We said that we want you to work on some water reuse. They said we will do it, and now they are doing it. And you know, saving 350 million gallons of water per year is actually a lot of water, even though Alan said that very matter-of-factly, very humbly. But it not only saves water, but I don't know if you caught the last part, the million dollars that they invested will actually end up saving them money when that's paid off in five years? Oh, three. Okay. Three years. So in three years, they start netting money because they did the right thing and are doing water reuse. So we're going to, I got to say this again, it's so fine. Save water and save money. It's a good combination. You like that. So I just want to, you know, just say we're happy to have them here and their expertise is helping us uh, manage our water resources. So thank you again to us. Um, our next speaker is a well-known name uh, across this island on the issue of water. Uh, Peter Scully was the regional, Region 1 Director of the New York State DEC and now is the Deputy uh, County Executive under Steve Ballone in Suffolk County. He's known by many names, the Water Czar, the Water Infrastructure Guru, and all of those things. So we're very happy to hear um, today from Peter Scully. So uh, I did want to comment on Alan's presentation and uh, you know commend Suez for their investment. The uh, title of this panel is investment. We talk about the payback period for that investment over three years. That's smart use of resources. Uh, in Suffolk County, we're, we're pretty proud of the use uh, projects uh, we have going on in Riverhead, where we take out more from the Riverhead Sewage Treatment Project that are our Indian Island Golf Course. But clearly, uh, we're just scratching the surface on the water use, and we have a lot, a lot more. To go. So we're looking forward to that. We have a much more basic uh, problem in Suffolk County, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit. I should point out for those of you uh, who may not be aware of the public policy implications, that sanitary sewers are considered one of the man's greatest, greatest objectives, particularly in urban areas, because uh, they protect pu both public health and the environment. They are in active cleaning of wastewater, wastewater for the street, and then all sorts of uh, natural forms of disease and beneficial to the environmental. Impacts, and that's the importance of, of sanitary sewers. Uh, and uh, you know, Allen Company serves Nassau County. I want to tell you, you weren't aware that 
difference between Nassau County and Suffolk County is that Nassau County is about 75% school. Um, took care of making sure that they act the way we in place as the county developed. Uh, Suffolk County, unfortunately, the reverse is true. We're about 75% uh, unsewered, and that has significant implications for us. If you look back, I usually do PowerPoint showing a bunch of clips from Newsday that date back to the 60s and the early 70s, where there were stern warnings in Suffolk County about the importance of banning cesspools, getting off of cesspools, moving towards sewering, or else water quality over time uh, would suffer. And uh, unfortunately, um, the county had a plan at one point to, to sewer uh, the entire county all the way after the end of 2004. So now that that would not, would not have been a cost effective or practical solution. But for a variety of reasons, uh, many of them are centered around the scandal that involved the first regional uh, sewer district that the county did put in place for this country in the southwest. The county never really moved forward to, uh, to sewer or provide any of the wastewater treatment for much of the county. 360,000 residential properties are still relying on cesspools or septic systems, most of them cesspools without any septic tanks. But the 20,000 commercial properties also rely on the systems that are not designed to treat the nitrogen. And all of the predicted uh, impacts on water quality, unfortunately, uh, have um, come with the current control of the uh, You see increasing frequency of harmful algal blooms uh, in Suffolk County, Long Island. We're, we're told we have more harmful algal blooms than any other area uh, in the country. Uh, we see all sorts of uh, impacts to uh, surface water, um, and scientists tell us, uh, based on studies, based on science, the administrator have to rely on what the scientists tell us when we're going to this information the science. And about 70% of the uh, excess nutrients which are impacting surface water are the result of cesspools and sediments impacting groundwater, groundwater flowing into surface water. The eye opener for me when I was at DEC was the North Shore and Bayman study that was completed as part of the Long Island South study that found the largest single source of uh, nitrogen into Long Island South was in fact groundwater. So it's a big problem in, in Suffolk County. It has uh, impacts not only on the environment, the water quality impacts that I just discussed, but also on our economy because without sewage treatment, uh, Development is constrained, particularly in downtown areas where we have a lot of empty stores these days. Uh, property owners can't do much because they don't have back to waste water treatment. They're not allowed to uh, to uh, add seats to a restaurant. We have some restaurants, for example, in, in Sado, which is a beautiful little business community, that use disposable paper plates and, and utensils, uh, creating additional solid waste because they can't afford uh, you know, their, their water allowances allowed to wash the dishes, so it's a good problem. Um, so what to do about it? Well, there, there are many reasons why sewers uh, don't happen in Suffolk County. There have been you know, some very small efforts uh, to provide a sewering. But sewering, in the absence of any sort of uh, subsidy to make it affordable, is just too expensive for individual uh, property owners. Back at the time, the county implemented the one sewer district it did in the 1980s. The federal government was paying about 75% of the cost of sewer projects. That, that, those programs dried up in the early 1980s. And when we look at sewering in the absence of any form of, of subsidy, we find that uh, you know, the mechanism that we have available to do that is the creation of a sewer district. It's pretty simple. We draw a boundary around a bunch, a bunch of properties. They're the benefited properties in the sewer district. We design a sewer system. We go out and borrow the money to do the construction. And then it's borrowed money. It's like a mortgage. Portion of portion of the mortgage payment to everybody in the benefited area, and when it all shakes out, in most cases we're talking about individual homeowners paying over three thousand dollars a year, or as much as four thousand dollars a year in new and additional taxes. With that type of cost to the individual property owner, there's no way any elected official is going to move forward with sewer. So right now we have some big sewer projects going on in Suffolk County only because of of subsidy. Um, Sandy, I was at uh, uh, DEC, it was the most exciting period of my career. Uh, the immediate aftermath of it was one thing, having to get uh, debris off of Long Island, uh, numerous oil spills that resulted on the South Shore where people basements flooded and their oil tanks flipped over, uh, new breaches in the Barrier Beach on Fire Island, and all that sort of stuff was immediate, you know, weeks after the storm. Six months after the storm, I was sitting in my office in DC, and somebody, one of my colleagues, told me, told me, said, You know, there's over a billion dollars in federal funding, post-sanity resiliency funding out there. 
I think we can make an argument that nitrogen pollution for cesspools and septic systems is degrading water quality and causing wetlands that protect the southern shore of Long Island to degrade, leaving us more vulnerable, and that by the federal government investing in sewer infrastructure will increase the coastal disease of Long Island. Uh, that theory led to a $400 million funding package for us to connect 5,000 parcels to sewers on the south shore of Long Island, called the Suffolk County Coastal Resiliency Initiative, eliminating 5,000 cesspools and with the strong support of, uh, of uh, people like Adrian and the environmental community and business uh, community organized labor and building trades. We're moving forward now with, with this project. We also have uh, uh, some projects that are being subsidized through state grants and moving forward to choose buckets like that. But in the absence of, uh, of subsidy, the cost of the property owner, uh, you know, just doesn't work. But uh, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the public policy implications of this. It was a county executive who took office in 2012 um, and instantly began looking at both economic development and environmental reasons at the fact that the building was really looking at the big picture and providing a, an overall plan to deal with the lack of atmosphere wastewater treatment in Southern County. Um, and we have to take action. Uh, the county uh, executive in 2014 declared nitrogen, public uh, water quality enemy number one and taking steps. Uh, Signed staff to go to states throughout the Northeast to see what they were doing about situations where uh, nitrogen pollution was a problem as soon as it made sense, seeing there are uh, alternatives to use accessible septics and active treatment systems, individual alternative to waste water treatment system. We'll talk about that a little bit. Adrian, tell me, tell me shut up if you need to. Uh, and um, uh, we'll get back to the public policy implications of this. But we're going to doing that, the county executive had staff apply for a program at the IBM Corporation. This is a program called the Smarter Cities Challenge program where municipalities can apply to IBM and in hope of being selected, have IBM send a team of experts to come to that municipality and assess a problem. So the county was selected. IBM sent a team of experts here in 2014 to look at the wastewater problem and came to a bunch of conclusions that you can't afford not to address this. The situation is not sustainable. Your property values are based in large part on the fact that you're surrounded by water. Your economy is based on large, in large part on the fact that you're surrounded by water. You have a $5 billion dollar year tourism economy. You need a long-term plan to fix your water problem crisis. And so uh, with support from uh, a lot of stakeholders, the county, uh, using a million dollars provided by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, began developing a sub-watersheds wastewater plan. that would do a couple of things for us. Uh, evaluate more than 190 individual watersheds throughout Suffolk County, trying to determine uh, what their environmental conditions were, uh, and to um, set net reductions, target reductions in nitrogen levels. So we can make science-based decisions about where the use of these new uh, alternative treatment systems would make the, uh, the most sense. So we have the sub-watersheds wastewater plan, which was released with much fanfare on July 31st, 2019 strongly supported by environmental groups, business, business leaders, organized labor, academics, and said, finally, we have a plan to move, uh, to move this forward. And it does provide science-based recommendations on how to address it. The key to all of it is finding a way to make it affordable for our homeowners to utilize these uh, new systems to phase out the use of systems. Would you want to use the microphone? Yeah, because you know, we don't want them to win. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. So the key, to, the key to success, the county executive has always said, is to find a way to make it affordable for property owners for us to move away from the use of cesspools and septic systems, active treatment, whether it's connecting to a sewer system, which is a cost-effective option in some areas, or to replace cesspools and septic systems with these new innovative alternative uh, systems. The county in 2017 implemented a grant program for homeowners who wish to voluntarily replace their cesspool or septic system with an IA system in. The voters had, in 2014 had approved $2 million a year for a grant program. And we began, we rolled that out in 2017, hoping to do about 200 systems a year, $2 million a year, $10,000 uh, a grant, about 200. Um, in 2018, something happened that was good news and bad news. Uh, the state implemented a, a $75 million a year, a $75 million septic system replacement program and said they they award the money in $15 million uh, trenches over uh, five years. And there were 62 counties in, in New York State, and $15 million divided by 62, each county should have gotten about $341,000. Suffolk County was awarded $10 million of the $15 million for the first year of the program. 
which is a big challenge for us because we had slashed the program and hired six staff, but we've cranked up uh, our program, and, and right now people are uh, flocking to our program uh, so much so that we've added nine additional staff and we're having a difficult time um, on keeping up with them. These are kind of interim and building steps because what the sub watershed wastewater plan does is provides a 50-year plan to connect hundreds of thousands of parcels to active water and active wastewater treatment. Could involve connecting parcels to sewer, mostly in areas where we have a, an existing wastewater treatment plant that has available capacity, or it could involve replacing cesspools and septic systems uh, with these new systems, um, either when the system fails and needs to be replaced, when a property changes hands, or after a, a, a program in Rhode Island, uh, and clearly with new construction. But whether we're connecting somebody to sewer or we're going to be using these new IA systems, we need to find a way to make it affordable for homeowners to, uh, to, you know, to take that step. And that's why the IBM Smarter Cities Challenge Report uh, recommended that we identify and create a stable uh, and recurring revenue stream to replace what used to be federal uh, grant funding to make it affordable for homeowners. And we've been working with uh, people in the environmental community and the business community to identify uh, potential uh, alternative financing mechanisms to make wastewater uh, treatment uh, improvements possible. Uh, we have underway right now uh, a feasibility study into the creation of a countywide water quality improvement district which will offer some recommendations as far as what a um, you know, mechanism for a funding stream might be, whether it be a surcharge on, on water usage or something year and after a program already in, in place in the uh, state of Maryland called the Bay Restoration Fee. It's going to be an interesting discussion, I think, in the months ahead about how we're going to move forward to, um, to you know, provide a funding stream for water quality improvements. The starting point of it all is that we really can't afford not uh, to undertake the challenge because we're surrounded by water. We're seeing increasingly closed beaches, uh, fish kills, uh, harmful algal blooms. All of these things detract from the value of a community which relies on a tourism economy uh, so heavily. And so uh, we're hopeful that policymakers in both head as we roll forward and complete the uh, subordinates wastewater plan will engage in a, uh, you know, a, a meaningful discussion. And then ultimately, uh, what we, I think we're going to see is you know, turning to the voters and asking the voters what they think about potential investment in, in water quality infrastructure. Exactly what form that takes, what's going to be proposed, I think uh, will become clear over the next year. And um, so stay tuned and uh, look forward to answering any questions. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, I just want to just accent one thing that Peter said, and that is that we need to treat our sewage. You know, this is not exactly a crazy notion. It is the 21st century. We are using uh, 17th century technology, or at least 80% of Suffolk is, and 20% of Nassau, where the sewage goes into basically a box of rocks, and then we wait for it to seep into the drinking water, and then we wonder what went wrong. So, and then it also seeps out into our bays and our estuaries. So I want you to know that the plan that Suffolk County put together, and again, Peter underplayed it, but this is, probably the most sophisticated management plan we've seen since the 208 study, so in about 40 years. It is the sub-watershed management plan. It divided Suffolk County up into 191 watersheds. And then scientifically analyzed what is causing all of the nitrogen loading in each one of those watersheds. Is it an outfall pipe from a, a, an STP? Is it septics and, and cesspools? Is it atmospheric deposition? Is it, everyone always says to me, it's stormwater runoff. We have to deal with the stormwater runoff. It's fertilizers. And yes, that's part of the problem. But as it turns out, the science is telling us that's a smaller part. Now, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean we shouldn't address it, because that's the low-hanging fruit. We should address it. But we can't fully address water quality on this island until we treat our sewage. And the reason I'm so emphatic about this is I do a lot of community presentations, and there's what we call a little gaggle of what we call nitrogen deniers, who are adamant that nitrogen is not causing harmful algal blooms because they don't understand the whole concept of miracle growth. 
that when you put nitrogen in water, plants grow. He denied that's true. He said, go tell Scots. But they are appearing and, and, and talking and saying, you know, this is not right, and, and they have no other plan, by the way. But my point to you is that this is a very serious um, endeavor. We have the science on it. Now we need to implement the change. And that's going to take, frankly, all of you also helping and supporting this kind of change. So here to also tell us about a change is uh, Thomas Paris, who is the Associate Vice President of Water for ACOM. ACOM is also a fa internationally famous uh, consulting company. Thomas has been there 38 years. Yeah, he started when he was 12. He was a brilliant child. Um, and he's going to talk a little bit about the key, because this is not just happening here on Long Island. This is not, I just want you to know, nitrogen loading into embayments and estuarine systems is not just occurring here. It actually is occurring across the globe. And so we have looked at the experience in other areas and said, how can we not reinvent the, re the wheel, but look at their science and apply it to helping to save Long Island. And Tom's going to tell us about one of those experiences. Great. Thank you very much. So I'd like to bring it to you, a little bit together. I know I want to talk about water we use. So I work on the of Boston, so I worked on Gillette Stadium, yes, the home of the Patriots, and I know everyone hates them because they continue to win. But they actually have a wastewater we use system with their uh, wastewater trip plant. And one of the unique situations with that is trying to figure out how you convince people to use wastewater we use. And it's very difficult. To the point, at the time when that stadium was first built, it was actually wet grass. The idea was to use the wastewater we used to, uh, to uh, water the grass. And the NFL Players Association would be doing it. Because they didn't want that high place to play this, rolling around on grass that was watered with wastewater. And that was the reality. So that, you have to think about things like that as far as the PR program. <coughs> the other thing is, I was involved with the 208 plan in Cape Cod, the update with the Cape Cod Commission. Um, it was 15 communities, 105 abatements. Um, Soul source aquifer, about, about 20 plus um, communities or villages, I guess I'll say, with the 15 communities. Uh, and one of the things was the sewering cape, it was somewhere about eight to, six to eight billion dollars. Very seasonal, so there's a lot of people saying we can't afford that. Um, and it never went into a lot of those programs. So as part of the 208 program, it was a look at how do we deal with traditional technologies, but also non traditions the aquaculture, the fertigation levels, the herbivorous berries, etc. So by doing that, we finally, about four years ago, got past DEP and US EPA approved the 2 plant update, which took that six to eight billion dollars down to about two to four billion dollars by using a combination of traditional and non-traditional technologies. So a huge win-win. Uh, it's kind of the roadmap now for those 15 communities on the Cape. Uh, there are only four major wastewater treatment plants on the Cape. All the rest of them rely similar to what uh, Peter was saying relative to septic. It's about 85 percent septic, but have all the same similar problems as Suffolk County and Long Island also has. The next phase went into working for the town of Orleans, one of the 15 communities. The town of Orleans is on the elbow of the Cape, if anyone's familiar with it. Uh, they did a comprehensive wastewater management plan, got approved back in 2011, went to town meeting to appropriate money to go forward with the design, and failed by six votes to do that. And then it lingered around for a long time doing nothing. Uh, the 208 plan obviously was that non-traditional, so when we came in, we said I had to work with the town of how we can build a better mousetrap to solve their problems. <clears throat> Uh, so we have a combination of things. Uh, they took, took a sewering plan that they had, which was about 60% of the communities. We reduced it down to about 24%. Um, in today's dollars, the original plan was about up to $80 million in cost for a population of about 700,000 a year round. So completely unaffordable, but the population goes to 20 to 25,000 easily during most of the summer, and probably peaks at 40,000 during the July 4th of the high. Um, seasonal events. Um, so we looked at a couple of things. We did, um, I did something I never thought I'd do in my 30 plus years of a thing, is I bought a million oysters. And for the three years, we actually grew oysters in one of the abatements to see how we can actually remove the nitrogen and have enough documentation to be able to go to the regulators and get them to approve that type of process. 
we are now moving forward with that, and the town is actually this is the first year that they've had the oysters now going in that particular menu. Wait, did you eat these oysters? I'm sorry. Did you eat these oysters? Well, very interesting. So during the three years when we were doing the program, the town can't sell the oysters. It's a Massachusetts law. However, what they did is during the, the fall time, just about this period of time, they would take we take the oysters out. And the ones that were of the legal size, they brought them to another conveyment, and anyone that had actually had fishing licenses or shellfish licenses could go get them for free. Wait, so, so they brought them to another conveyment, they put them in there, and then they said, oh, now you can harvest them? They could harvest them there. Because, because what we were doing, they were, they were all floating bags. Because we had to, in order to maintain them and continue to locate them. So we put them in the natural thing, so just about this time, every year for the last three years, that we, on Thanksgiving, they've all had, had oysters that we've all grown for a couple of years. The other thing we did was called a permeolactic barrier. We did a uh, emulsified vegetable oil and put in the ground. We're in the fourth year of that particular study, uh, showing some wonderful results as far as the program goes. What is that? So by implementing those couple of things, we're getting the prices down from about 180 million down to about uh, 90 million. But the problem still is. Oh sure, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll show. So a PRB is actually a. Uh, we do an injection of a vegetable oil. Uh, we have a pilot study going on, which is about 200 feet long. Um, the injection is down between 50 to 70 feet in depth. Uh, the vegetable oil goes in there and creates the carbon source uh, and sticks to the sand particles. And so when the nutrient laden groundwater is coming through it, it goes through that barrier, which is about three foot wide, in our case 200 feet long creates a nitrification, denitrification process, and removes the nitrogen from it, and goes with an arc uh, We've had some great success with it. We've had some nitrogen levels up as high as 35 milligrams per liter coming in, and zero coming out. Uh, so it's very positive. Now, the technology's been around for 40 plus years, uh, but never really looked at it for nitrogen only. And it's always been used for other constituents only. So it's really a very promising, and we're in, Getting ready now to go to EPA and Mass DEP also to then say, okay, here's the results. We now want to use this as, a, as an implementation thing in order to reduce the amount of sewering that Old Lanes was facing in other communities. So the problem still was, how do we still afford the $90 million? Uh, so a couple of things have happened over the, the last couple of years. One is, yes, we have what's called the SRF loan program, the State Involved Loan Program in Massachusetts. Uh, they have the ability of a 30 year loan. In a 30 year loan at 0% interest. Oh. So it's about a $15 million savings. That was a Larry bill that was put in place about five years ago uh, dealing with the Cape and Islands. And the reason why that got pushed through was the Cape generates about $700 million in taxes to the state of Massachusetts, but only gets about $30 million back. So a huge swing. So the communities all got together in the collaboration, as was discussed this morning was with the regulators said, look, we need to have money in order to deal with our wastewater issues and the nitrogen issues. And I know Peter talked about some of the impacts of that, and that's exactly what's happening down the Cape. The values of houses were going down, and you always see the, the taxes coming down continue to degrade. So that was a huge swing for, um, obviously, for money savings. It still left a lot of money on the table in order to deal with it. Uh, so we continue to, to deal with the regulators, and last, just about a year ago, the state passed what they call a short-term interest tax on rentals. So anyone that was renting a house for X amount of period of time would have to get on it, register it, and a certain percentage of money then would get charged for that, it goes into a fund. And the fund was collaborated with the uh, Massachusetts, and they get some of that money back. And let's talk about some of the numbers. Uh, with it, because it's kind of frightening if it even comes anywhere close to this being reality. So in the Orleans case, I'm going to talk about the first particular project was about 48 million out of that 90 million I talked about. Um, they call the Cape and Island Trust Fund, which is part of these short-term interest tasks, gets a 25% grant back to the community. So from Orleans case, now we're taking 11 million dollars off the table from that 48 million. The zero percent money from the SRF program also has what they call a 10% fiscal forgiveness piece. So another X amount of dollars comes off the table. Um, Orleans has talked about doing betterments, at least a portion of the project. The portion was a collection system. They felt that the treatment plan nothing disposal is a town-wide benefit, and therefore everyone should benefit from the clean water, so they put that in the tax rate. Um, about $9 million was going to go for betterments for the people that were going to actually benefit from the project. 
six percent motel hotel tax, which like they can recommend, came up with about another ten million dollars. So it left eleven million dollars out of the forty-eight million we talked about. So an example was if twenty-five percent of the seasonal homes in Orleans rents their house for four weeks at three thousand dollars a week, it generates about twelve million dollars. Which means that eleven million dollars I mentioned at the bottom line now disappears, which means all you have is the $9 million in the veterans. We've been told by the realtors and a lot of the other associations that the assumption of 25% of the you know, population renting for four weeks is low. But the order of magnitude of two or three times, which means if it's low by just one time, that means we generate another $11 million, which means a $48 million project is paid for at zero dollars to local people. Now, yes, it's still taxes, but with the taxing, it is all the seasonal population that are coming in, which is what's driving the wastewater needs in the project. And with that, I'm going to finish it off and turn it back to him. Or Adrian. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay, and last but not least, uh, we have someone who's also worked on water for a few years. Um, <laughs> Gary is with uh, REI, I'm uh, sorry, GEI. REI is the outdoor sports guy. Sorry. He does, that's where he shops, that's why I'm confused. But GEI, I'm sorry, which is a consulting company that is well known and well established across Long Island on the expertise on water infrastructure and, uh, and water needs. And so Gary's going to sum up this today and then we're going to open it up for questions and discussions. Thank you. I guess I should be saying good afternoon. Cool. Um, so you've heard from the speakers, and, uh, and I asked to back clean up here so that I could sort of take some of all of what they've been saying, and, and I wanted to tie it back to a couple of things. First of all, the fact is we are here today at Smart Road Conference. It's about growth. It's about smart growth. So we're talking a lot about it. They did this morning, transit-oriented development, affordable housing, uh, things along those lines, the things that we need. Well, it's clear from the discussions just had here now, that you won't get growth, smart or otherwise, unless you tackle the water issues, the sewage issues, the sewer issues, okay? Adrian made it very clear, and others, that you've got groundwater, you've got surface water, it all ties together to facilitate growth, but also it is the economy that we all live off of, the majority of us live off of here on Long Island. Uh, so what I wanted to point out is, is that there are tools from an engineering perspective. I'm an engineer. I look at things of how do we get these things done. Now, I can tell you that I've been involved with sewer treatment plant upgrades, with sewer lines, and in fact, just recently, when we were talking about tying into these sewer lines that are coming up, a commercial establishment can be spending, they're just they're doing it today, about $100,000 plus to make that connection. A lot of money. You've got some people who are not able to connect with a gravity line to the sewer that might be coming in. Now they've got to put their own pump station. Not $100,000, but we're talking substantial money. So what, what can we do to not only facilitate that, but also at the same time, how about we try and minimize the amount of contamination that we have here on the island and incorporate it into the redevelopment process. So by that, we can then look to minimize the amount of impacts on the groundwater by actually doing the infrastructure investments we're talking about. Uh, what am I talking about? I'm talking about certain tools that we have available to us on a technical side. A particular one is, is the whole New York State Ground Seal Screening Program. So that provides, and this has been documented, that if every dollar of state tax credit brings about $6 of private money back, which is what this is all about. This is about facilitating growth. In the process of doing that, you're able to then take these properties, because everywhere where they're going to be putting in sewers, they're going to be putting in pump stations and the like, there's a great chance that you're going to be running into contamination. Why? Because of the legacy of contamination on Long Island, but also it's about, you, you read about it in the papers all the time about, well, we, we came across some contaminated fill that was brought in here from out of the area. There, there's a good deal of it out there. So we can 
incorporate how to clean that up into the use of the property in a way that takes advantage of the construction as part of the remediation. So you're not just simply paying for remediation. You're, you're doing some, but you're also taking the, the fact that you're putting in parking lots and buildings to act as caps for the materials that remain in place. So it's very cost effective. And so there are tools there through this process that enable private uh, citizens to, to invest in, in these redevelopment plans. So that's one thing. Now the second thing is, is that New York State just last year revised what they call their 360 regulations. So what is that? 360 is what manages solid waste generation in, in New York State. What they have done is, is that they have, this is the first time in like 25 years that they've revised this regulation. The regulation recognizes that you can reuse materials that are contaminated in certain instances. In fact, they have specific requirements for Long Island, where they say, now if you're on Long Island and you're protecting the soil source aquifer, the limits have to consider this, that, and the other thing because you're in an aquifer. So it's very clear that it's well thought through. So that what has been happening up until this time is, is that you have people doing excavation for these lines, for the pump stations. Now they've got to take it off Long Island because there's no more landfills, right? So it goes off and you've got to pay for this and you've got to put it in a truck and you get all the sustainability issues that are, you're, you're driving the carbon levels up. So that goes out of state. So what about if we can take this material and reuse it on site or reuse it in other ways on site so that we can minimize the amount of material that has to be hauled off. We minimize the amount of clean fill that's got to be brought in because if you dig a hole and you got to put stuff back and they got to bring clean fill in, now you're bringing that stuff in from New Jersey, whatever the case may be. So you've got these tools that can help you to facilitate the growth at the same time as investing in the water, water quality, the sewers, things related to that. So that you can then make it affordable or more affordable. You can make it more practical. And at the same time, even minimize the amount of impacts where, the, where you're coming up with these, these materials that are, in some cases, obviously sitting there in an area where there's a playground or whatever somebody's house. Or just simply that you've got a brownfield site that nobody wants to do anything with, and it's just it's damning a whole area-wide redevelopment scheme because the people don't want to take on this property. So there's some learning that has to be done, and I can tell you the development community on Long Island is embracing this now, but they're finding that through these regulations, as a volunteer coming in, you're not considered the responsible party. So there's all sorts of protections, so it's been well worked out and these things are available to us. So I think I'll stop there and we can hand it over. Can you do a slide conversation on the land bank? Oh, well, you know, I should have mentioned that. Who just grabbed that? No, too late. <laughs> so, so I want to give credit where credit is due. Suffolk County has a wonderful land bank. In fact, I uh, chaired a, a, a session at the uh, EPA Ground Seals Conference in Chicago a couple of years back, highlighting Suffolk County's land bank. Because what they're doing is that they're taking these blighted properties, Brown Steel's properties, turning them back into productive reuse. Peter can talk more specifically, if necessary, about the, the ways that the county gets whacked on the tax dollars into this. So now with the land bank taking this on, and, and I've been working with them for years, Sarah Lansdale, she was a great person, it goes all the way back to years. This is in place and it's helping the whole thing to come together. So it's tied to the Browns Fields, the redevelopment. I just saw that they, they were able to process two of the King's Parks properties. <laughs> all right, taking this back. All right, but thank, thank you very much. Can we give a round of applause to our speakers today? to um, you know the battle to actually treat our sewage here on Long Island and upgrade our infrastructure we also have another battle with groundwater too which is the quality of it in the terms of uh, toxics and now the new emerging contaminants of 14 dioxane PFOA and PFOS so we do have a great deal of challenges uh, here on Long Island that many government leaders and many advocates are leading the charge um, to address it's not easy frankly and it is complicated and it is costly so my last statement I'm going to say is clean drinking water isn't free. I wish it was, but it isn't. 
It's going to take some investments for infrastructure, for treatment sewage, but also for uh, technology to treat drinking water and filter out volatile organic chemicals, pesticides, pharmaceutical drugs, 1,4-dioxane, PFOA, PFOS. You know, these are things we work really hard here on Long Island to keep people away from so we can be healthy, but unfortunately, our drinking water is vulnerable and we have a lot of challenges to do. So, um, all I'm saying with that is we need your support um, for these changes that are ahead, and, uh, and changes are ahead, particularly next year in 2020. So, who has the first question? Come on. Yes. Neil Lewis from the <laughs> Lewis Sustainability uh, Institute. Yes, thank you, Adrian, and thank you. You're such a great advocate for Long Island's environment, everything that you do, um, you. at Citizens Campaign for the Environment, great stuff. Um, I just, uh, wanted to uh, speak to uh, Peter Scully, uh, Suffolk County. Uh, Suffolk County with uh, uh, Steve Ballone and, and really a great team over there. Uh, Peter's doing a tremendous job in leading this effort. And um, I find it all very complex and a little bit hard to follow. And the cost issues are real. Your point of good quality water is not free. We have to make investments in it. We heard today a discussion of um, parking garages and how parking garages can cost as much as thirty or forty thousand per parking space. So you have like twelve million dollar investment to get like three hundred parking spaces. Um, is the systems that we're talking about here always going to be kind of like parking garages in the sense that it's not like computers where the price gets cheaper every time they make a new improvement? It's always going to be kind of expensive. We're always going to have to invest some money in it just because it's so important and it's something that you, there's no quick, easy, cheap fixes. We just have to address it in a serious way. And like I said, I do want to really commend your leadership, Peter, on this issue. Thanks. That, I think that's a, that's a great question. So to put things in perspective, right, you know, uh, sewering was always seen as the as the solution. The sewering is, is very expensive. So I have two statistics for you. Uh, we're doing a, a, a sewer project in the Forge River uh, watershed in Mastic using federal funding, and the cost per home for us to do that is $103,000. Nassau County completed a study several years ago in an unsewered area in uh, North Shore of Nassau County and concluded that the cost for sewer in that community would be $120,000 per parcel. A conventional uh, cesspool or septic system depending on the site, it costs you six or seven thousand dollars, but market forces determine what you ultimately pay, and that means the market will pay, will charge you what you're willing to pay, and I know the situation involving the staff member in, a, uh, in the Community Development Corporation of Long Island had her cesspool replaced. If your cesspool fails, you want to replace it quickly, right? And so, um, they, you can't flush your toilet, that's a problem. So uh, she explained she left it to her husband, and so he arranged for have a cesspool company come and replace their cesspool, and he put what on the credit card? $12,000. So a cesspool is fairly expensive, right? Sewering costs over $100,000 a parcel if you don't have a treatment work, or maybe if you do. And the average cost of us putting an IA systems in under our current grant program is around $22,000. So uh, we think it's important that people not pay out of pocket for that. But we're also, to directly answer your question, we're thinking that over time, as the volume of the number of systems uh, increases, the cost per system should go down. People in the industry tell us, for example, that if they were doing a, a single installation on a block, it's going to be one price per system. But we can encourage more people on a block to do it. There's a kind of scale. We're working with uh, Adrian's group to do outreach. And so we hope that the cost per system will go down. But you, you know, we hear out there people saying it's, it's thirty thousand dollars and a homeowner have to pay. When you hear stuff like that from the person in the United States. I thought Suffolk County made it clear they wouldn't, they're not going to move forward unless they can make it affordable. And the average cost so far is only twenty-two thousand dollars, and people aren't paying out of pocket. That's where we're going. So. so, and I just want to say too. I mean, you know, Peter said, oh, the ten million dollars that the county got was good news and bad news. We environmentalists only consider it good news. Because you know, they got the lion's share of a fifteen million dollar allocation that went throughout the state. Nassau got one million, Suffolk got ten million. Uh, in this year's budget, in the twenty nineteen budget, New York State allocated an additional eighty five million dollars for septic replacement programs that also would be allocated over five years. So we do believe there's state money out there. We believe Suffolk County, which is known as the septic capital of America, is not a claim to fame we like, but we want. 
we want to change that, but we believe that they'll also be eligible for the uh, lion's share. There are many advocacy groups that are working in Albany, including my own CCE, um, to make sure that that happens and continues to happen. So people are getting loans, I'm sorry, they're getting grants, which is, I never get to say this as an advocate, but tell people, you could get up to twenty to thirty thousand dollars to replace your septic. You're successful with a new IA. You could replace your septic with a new septic. It's seven to ten thousand dollars on your own, or you could get a grant and pay two thousand for the engineer's fee and zero for the rest. It's your choice. So um, we are really fighting to make it affordable, and we do believe that the price will come down. Okay, sorry. Next question. Yes. The future of our towns in terms of revitalization. I live in North in St. James. Uh, Smithtown, and now of course Kings Park just uh, got the rent for uh, sewer. We are working towards that. And hopefully that will happen very soon. Or when I say soon, I'm You mean not geological time? <laughs> now is, how do we, I, I just formed an organization two years ago called Celebrate St. James. Okay. I, you're right here. Oh, Peter's here. Some sort of question. Yeah. The question is, because we do not have an active chamber that cohesively brings the businesses together, how can I help my community prepare for the fact that they don't have to pay for this in order for us to be able to have economic growth and cultural revitalization. You know, that is a, a really, really enlightened question. Yes. And uh, as, a, as someone who grew up in St. James, we care deeply about the community and our nice power and leadership in creating that organization. So, but to answer your question directly, I mean, I, I think there's probably some value in bringing people together in form to talk about water problems. I, I've observed what's going on in St. James, and I just hear the term sewer, like they're going to magically appear, right? And I think that's kind of what the concern is. I think there's probably a lot of value to having people in the room and, and explaining how a sewer district works, showing examples from other areas that are sewer and other projected causes of the problem, just so people know what to expect. Um, you know, holding a public meeting and talking about what it means, how much it's going to cost, and all that sort of thing. I think that's probably a good idea. I've observed, um, you know, with some admiration, uh, the, the kind of cohesiveness you're trying to build in that community. And I would suggest that you may want to have a, a uh, you know, an outreach meeting, even integrated organizing on water quality uh, and what the future holds for St. James. That would be a, a good thing to do. Yeah, we can definitely do that. The future of St. James. That actually could be the, the name of the community forum. Yes. Laura. Hi, guys. Uh, again, thank you to Peter and Adrian because you guys do an amazing job. And uh, we do need this. Can Peter and maybe uh, Alan just talk a little bit on the difference when you talk about hundred thousand dollars for a sewer plant and then maybe twenty-two or forty for the AI systems. Why uh, it's beneficial to do the plant in some areas and more beneficial to do the AI? If there's such a cost difference. Why wouldn't we just do all AIs? Explain why we we probably need both systems. Well, um, and this is a uh, a question and response that is appropriate to person who, who raises the question. Uh, what we're finding with the, uh, with the IA systems is that um, there are certain areas where groundwater elevations are high, groundwater is very close to the surface, uh, and lot sizes are very, very small, uh, where IA systems are a real challenge. And that's because there's a requirement that, if, that there be a separation between the system and groundwater. Um, and that makes it very difficult in areas where the, the groundwater is only a couple inches below ground, right? To comply with the current code, therefore, you need to build a, uh, an expensive retaining wall, right? Elevate the system. The retaining wall adds thirty or forty thousand dollars to the cost per parcel, and there are other inefficiencies inherent in trying to to plot IAs on postage postage stamp size lots in areas where you're in close proximity. Right? That's that's kind of a general answer. One last question. Let me just check the time. Uh, who's got a last question? I think so. Yes. So I'd like to have David kind of also speak to the importance of education. When you, when you look at some county and we talk to most of the people in our communities, they're really not aware of what happens when they question the process. Okay. And, and it's out of sight, out of mind, right? Yeah. So 
so, so how do we, how do we, moving forward, think about building our building an educational plan into each of these well, I'll just briefly say, you know, I couldn't agree more. I mean, as you know, I do a lot of community meetings. I was last night, I was actually at Helen's Library last night um, in, uh, is that, I can't, I don't know what community I'm in. That was considered Melville? Melville, technically, Hollow Hills. Hill's in Melville, and ask the question of the audience. Let's start out and just ask you, where does your water come from? First person raised their hand and said, New York City. And, and we still, it's, it's, it's so, um, and we've been working very hard to educate people that, you know, 100% of the water comes from underground, it's an aquifer. And still, I mean, we did this um, film thing where we, our team at CC, we went out, we just did a person on the street interview. And we couldn't even use half the responses because it would have been too embarrassing to put it in a video. One woman said, I think it's the Gowanus Canal. And, and she was dead serious. I was like, oh God. So, you know, there is a very, still as much as we try, I think we need to get it into the schools. Where does your drinking water come from? How is sewage treated? This is a basic human necessity to know this, to understand it, so they can understand why it's important to address these issues. So, I mean, I really do believe it needs to be more of a curriculum in the schools. If, if after 30 years of work and we're still asking community people, where does your water come from? And they say the Underground River from Connecticut, um, I had, a, I had a meeting with an elected official a couple years ago. She insisted that there was a dye test that illustrated that the water from Connecticut went under the Long Island Sound and popped up in a river here on Long Island. And I said, who are these people that waited 5,000 years for the dye to show up? I mean, <laughs> and then I told her, I never want you to say that again. It's wrong. <laughs> Okay, that was off the record. No names, no times. Um, okay, so 100% agree. We need education. We need all of your help. We need your voice and your engagement in this issue. Thank you for coming today. We appreciate it. Now go get lunch.